Okay, thank you for joining us, everyone. Good morning from a cloudy New York City. Thank you for joining us today for another segment of our Global Business Chat. Uh, today, we're going to be focusing on the country of Ghana, uh, which one might call a gateway to Africa. And we're going to explore why. Uh, but first, I want to thank our Global Business Council that helps put this together for all the work that they do. And I want to introduce us as the council that provides our members with the tools and resources to connect globally with real estate professionals around the world. And that's part of what we're doing here today. If you're not part of your own Global Business Council in the association that you belong in, I highly encourage you to look into it. Uh, we offer at Hudson Gateway the, a collaborative system of information and networking opportunities. And what we wanna do is to try to create an international bri bridge for doing business around the world. And that's what we're doing here today. And we're gonna welcome Kobani Adesei Pisa from the Ghana, Ghana Real Estate Professionals Association. And he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about the real estate transaction in Ghana. So in our uh, segments, we don't normally talk about the hot new developments, the new condos being built, or you know, a broker's listings. We don't talk about that. This is an educational program where we talk about the nuts and bolts of a real estate transaction in the country that we're featuring. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to follow the steps, the guidelines. So if you, you have a client that you want to refer to someone in Ghana, you can have a, an informed conversation with your client and be aware of what your client is getting into when they're dealing in another jurisdiction. So today, I'd like to welcome Kobena. And I also want to welcome two other special guests. Um, I want to uh, welcome Ahmed Badat, who is sort of a, a rock star in the realtor international uh, world. And Ahmed was so kind as to make the introductions for us today that help us set this up. And I also want to welcome another special guest, Vicky Sampa, who is actually the founder and CEO of the Ghana Real Estate Professionals Association. Um, first, Ahmed, thank you very much for helping us to put this together. Uh, please tell us a little bit about, about yourself so that we can know a little bit more about you. Thank you, Tony. Um, you know, so I've been involved with the NAR International going back to 1991 when the CIPS program was taken over by uh, NAR from uh, FIOPSI. And it was known at that time as the international section of NAR. So I've been involved for a long time, been uh, earlier when the global ambassador position was started, was called a president liaison. And I was a PL to South Africa. And then thereafter for a number of years to the UAE. Uh, and in the last, this is my second stint with South Africa, Ghana, and the latest newest partner in Africa, which is Nigeria. And uh, Vicky is known to me. She is, every, any, you know, everything you want to know about web Vicky is a great resource. She is one of the founding, she is the founding member and has a lot of information on that. But uh, thank you, Kwabina, for stepping up to the plate to, you know, for the request made by our friends at uh, Hudson Gateway. And uh, thank you very much. Looking forward to your program. Thank you, Ahmed, and thanks for being a global ambassador to South Africa, Ghana, and Nigeria. We know you'll do a great job this year, and we'll be looking forward to uh, to getting information from you as, as we try to grow our networking and our resources in that region as well. And I also want to introduce Vicky Sampa. Vicky, I'll let you do your own introduction uh, because, you know, you are the founder of GREPA, right? That's correct. And, and tell us a little bit about yourself uh, and your your relation to GREPA. And uh, you're, you're coming to us from the Main Street Organization of Realtors in Chicago, Illinois. Well, yes. Um, again, my name is Vicky Sampa. Uh, just a point of correction, I'm not the CEO of GREPA. I am the founder of GREPA and CEO of Abri Consult Limited, both in the U.S. and in Ghana. I, um, I have served uh, 
I've, I've been a realtor for over 20 years and I have also served on uh, committees at the Main Street Organization of Realtors, uh, Global Council, and also the NAR um, Global Council as well. I chaired the committee. I was also the PL to Ghana um, prior to I met. And uh, so I, I have a lot of experience and a lot of um, um, interest in, in supporting Ghana's real estate. Um, what else can I say? But I'm, I'm just here to support Pabena and um, there's a lot that we, we can talk about. We can go on and on and on. We just finished uh, our first conference, ACT conference, which was um, great. And uh, we're looking forward to do another conference in 2022, um, God permitting and COVID allowing us to do so. We'll invite um, all the global business councils to uh, come in and support us. But um, other than that, uh, I'll just um, allow the meeting to go on. And uh, thank you very much. Great, thank you. And we'll invite you back uh, with Kobena a little later on to talk a little bit about that conference because what we're doing here today we're talking about the nuts and nuts and bolts of the real estate transaction, but something very special is happening in Ghana with Grepa, with with the conference you just had at NAR. Um, you just recently had your first CIPS classes in Ghana um, that were taught, I believe, by Maurice Hampton. So that's something very, very important um, that we are trying to spread around the world, and you're helping to do that. Um, and that that's what grows our CIPS network. That's what adds value to everything that we do. Um, but before we get to that, uh, Kobena, if you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about uh, your role with Grepa and with Aubrey Properties, and then we'll start the discussion with the nuts and bolts of the real estate transaction. Tony, I'd just like to chip in one more thing. I just joined uh, Chicago Association of Realtors. So um, just a point of correction, I'm with Carr right now. Oh, with car. Okay. I knew that the two of them always confused me. Thanks, Kabena. Tell us a little bit something about your relation with Grepa. Thank you very much, Sony. Um, my name is Kabena Edusei Piasan, like you have mentioned. Uh, I serve as a project coordinator for the Ghana Real Estate Professionals Association. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I have been here for a few years, like five years. Uh, I met this great woman and then she was like, hey, I see you have a passion for real estate too. Come here, come to Grepa. I'm like, yeah, I know about Grepa already, but um, I didn't know that I was going to be that fortunate to, to just get into Grepa like that. So it's been a few years and here we are. I am always eager to serve the association. I speak for the association sometimes uh, when we, we, our PR is not available, I speak um, for the association. And then um, I work as a project coordinator trying to organize um, our projects. So yes, for a few years, I have been with Grepa. Great. And one of the important things about Grepa is that you've really been leading the way toward uh, really institutionalizing the practice of real estate in Ghana, right? Uh, you've, you've been at the forefront of promoting education, uh, licensing, and, and basically, you know, one of the issues that we find around the world that we learn when we do these global business chats is that in many countries, you, you don't need to be licensed to practice in real estate. And of course, obviously, that leads to a lot of issues for consumers. Um, that changed not long ago in Ghana, right, with the passage of the Ghana Real Estate Act that now requires everyone to be licensed. Is that the current law in Ghana now? Yes, that, uh, correct. Um, so... We can say that mostly about the whole of Africa, the entire Africa. And um, like, like you rightly said, it will take a vision and somebody who has experienced what is being done elsewhere to initiate some of these radical, um, radical changes. 
So yes, um, for the past decade, it has been serious advocacy, one after the other, trying to challenge authorities like African governments to look into real estate and take it more seriously and get it formalized, get it regulated so that um, things can be done in a much more sanitized manner, just like being done elsewhere around the world. So luckily for us, we had government's attention after 10 years. And here we are with the passage of the real estate agency bill, which is now an act. So yes, you, like you said, you're correct. Ghana is leading this charge. And this is great because it provides consumers with a level of safety and confidence uh, in, when they're looking to do business in a particular country. And this probably explains why the real estate market in Ghana is really booming right now, isn't it? Yes, and especially to give more confidence out there to the world that we are ready to do things the right way as the whole world um, expects. And like you mentioned in your earlier introduction, Ghana has always been the, the gateway to Africa. And we have been the pace setters. Um, there's so many things that we have been first to, to do. And um, Grandpa is also equally following on that trajectory. We are the first to do a lot of things in the real estate um, sector in, in Africa, not just in Ghana, in Africa. Right. And this is great. And, and obviously what we're doing here is trying to teach our audience about the real estate process in the country that we're featuring today, Ghana. But we also want to grow our network. So when we need to refer a client to a professional in Ghana, we could at least be assured that that person, number one, is going to be licensed. And number two, we could go to Grepa and have you be the source of the source, as we like to call it. Um, when we need to refer a professional to a client. Yes, certainly, certainly. And this has been the, the core of the, the entire struggle for the past 10 years. So that people like you, anywhere around the world will have the confidence and the trust to want to do things the right way and have the confidence to invest in this country, Ghana, or anywhere else in Africa. The vision is bigger, is, is about to take off and spread into other African countries and get them to also look at the real estate sector and how things can be done to sanitize it and do things the right way professionally. I believe professionalism is the word. Great, and and that's why I, you know today's, today's session is a, a little bit different because we're talking about a couple of other things that we don't normally talk about only because what you're doing, I think, is so visionary. A lot of other uh, real estate associations aren't taking the kind of steps that you're taking. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, promoting licensing and education in your country, but there are two other things that happened just this year that are equally important, maybe even more so for professionals who are in the practice of real estate. Uh, one Vicky had mentioned is the CIPS, uh, live CIPS classes that we had in Ghana this year. And also the collaboration for the first time ever, uh, putting together a conference with, with NAR. Right? Tell us a little bit about that conference and why it's so important, not just for real estate professionals in Ghana, but really in, in, in Africa and the world actually. Okay, so the African Real Estate Conference and Expo, we call it AC, the AC 21. Um, it, it has been initiated. And when I say it has been initiated, it means it's not just, it's, it's going to be an annual thing. It has been initiated um, to be held like initially every year, initially every two years, sorry. And it was going to be held in different countries in Africa. That's, that's the vision, that's the whole vision about this. And um, the first one was expected to be held in, in Accra, Ghana, of course. And 
subsequently would be would be rotated in different other parts of Africa. To give a perspective and more clarity, I want to I want to say that Africa is a is a huge continent made up of 54 countries, and Ghana is only one of these 54 countries. So if Ghana is the first to do anything, then it means the first out of 54 countries. And if Grepa is the first to do anything, then you get a, the wider scope of how big a milestone or an achievement it is. So um, like you rightly said, the first conference in collaboration with the NAR, for which reason we are the first to introduce the Certified International Property Specialist designation. Um, I would like to share some, some, some pictures, if you don't mind. So of course. You know, yeah. So um, And while we're getting that up, Vicky, how many students took the CIPS course in Ghana this year? Uh, we had about 32 students in the class. Um, some of them, uh, the total of about 32. Um, Incredible. Some came first two days, others were able, only able to do, you know, one day or three days. But in total, we had about 32 students, which was great for the first That's time. Incredible. That, that's incredible. I think the statistics in New York State, for example, and you think the state of New York is one of one of the largest states in the country uh, uh, of the U.S. And I think we probably have less than 200 agents who hold the CIPS designation. So when you're talking about 30 students taking the class, um, that's a real tremendous uh, a feat to accomplish. It was, and, and even after the class, we had a lot of people calling in to find out when the next class is coming up. So we're looking at having another one even prior to Act 22. Um, if the instructor is available to teach another CIPS class, we'll be very excited to have that. That's right. And both, of course, obviously both you and Kobena have the CIPS designation. And, uh, you know, of course, everybody who has it knows the importance of, of that network and what that network does, right? Right, yes. And um, I, I've, I've been a CIPS for, I think, since 2014. And so the, the benefits of being a CIPS, it's something that you cannot, you know, take for granted. So um, the students also heard from the instructor who also has a passion for Africa, uh, Maurice Hampton, has been to Ghana. This is the second time he's been to Ghana. He's also taught, uh, this is the fourth class that he's taught. He taught ABR, EPRO, uh, Code of Ethics, and I think PSA, if, if, I, if that's correct. Um, so some of the students already knew him and were excited for his coming. So that even made it more, more impactful. And so they, they definitely cannot wait to see him back. Great, and it can't get better than Maurice Hampton who's extremely uh, active in the CIPS world and at, at the NAR level, um, also in your association. I think he's from Chicago or Main Street. I always forget which one. Uh, uh, Chicago. 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 <laughs> so uh, yeah, a very, very dynamic instructor, instructor that's for sure. Um, so, Kobenda, it, let's talk a little bit about the other thing that we don't normally talk about, um, and we're gonna get the, into this a little bit more later. So we're gonna talk about how do we find a property? We have a client, they're in Ghana, they need to look for a property. Here in the United States, people will go on realtor.com, they'll go on Zillow. Before they even talk to a real estate agent, they already have like 10 properties they're interested in looking at. Um, you know, we, we have an MLS, an MLS here in the US and different, uh, you know, in our associations, that have consumer facing websites where consumers have access to a lot of information, a lot of listings. Grepa actually has also led the way 
in creating the first MLS in Ghana. Is that is that the case? Yes, that's correct. The first MLS in Africa. The first in Africa. And so yes. how is that changing? How, how does that help the consumer in Ghana? How, how fast is your MLS growing? What, what areas does it cover? And why, why is it so important? Why is it such a game changer for how real estate is being practiced in Ghana? It is a game changer because um, I believe you, you know more the importance of the MLS more than I do here. It's a new thing that has recently been introduced to me in this market. Um, it is difficult to bring change. So we, we are, Grepa, I mean, we are still sensitizing and advocating and to get a lot of people to use the system because it has a uh, ability to collate data and store it. And this is a part of the world that real estate data is very, very scarce. Um, it's almost non-existent. So the MLS is a solution to many things at the same time. So um, we are still on advocacy as part of our advocacy to try to get real estate practitioners to see the essence of the, of the MLS and get to use it um, more largely. We do have a lot of properties on there and we have also achieved one milestone with the MLS, which is international syndication on realtor.com. Realtor.com is now syndicating properties listed on our MLS. I believe the other day, Kathleen was able to pull up the MLS when we had the rehearsal. Um, Loop Ghana, the Loop Ghana, uh, dot com, which has a lot of properties which are also syndicated to realtor.com. Um, these are very giant steps. We are still talking to other stakeholders to see the need and the importance. But like I said, our market is a very young market. The change will come, but not in with rapid speed as may happen in other parts of the world. So are consumers getting their information from your MLS? Are consumers pulling data, real estate listings from the MLS? Do you find that they're doing that before they reach out to you as a real estate professional? Or is it still a nascent uh, program that, that a lot of people don't really have a lot of knowledge about cons consumers from the consumer end? Yes, people do. We get a lot of feedback as the administrators, the office, we get a lot of uh, feedback from all over, not just people in Ghana, but from, and especially, and the most encouraging part is the fact that people who are using the MLS, like uh, real estate practitioners who are using the MLS, they have been amazed by the extent that People will be contacting them from around the world to make inquiries about a certain property and all of that. So this is like a miracle in the industry. Everybody is amazed about this. And um, we still need help to put it out there and to get it outside of Ghana for people to really know that, yeah, this is the way to go. It makes it, it, makes it so simple. It makes it so organized. It makes it so, I mean, wonderful. So, um, yes, it has been good. So tell us a little bit about the real estate process. So I have, a, I have a client. I'm going to refer him to a licensed real estate professional in Ghana. My client's interested in purchasing a property. Where does that person start? Once he makes that connection with the licensee in Ghana, how does that start? He's, he or she is interested in an investment property, a, a second home, how does the process first initiate once the contact is made? Do you show the properties? Do you discuss what, what listings are available? Do you discuss what you find in the MLS or do you reach out to different agents? How does that start in Ghana? So our experience mostly with foreign clients has been coming from the M MLS. So normally it begins with the client being able to identify a certain property and wanting to make inquiries about the property. This is how it begins. And I would like to believe that for somebody to probably see a, a listing on realtor.com and to want to follow up, then it means that they know that these are coming from professionals, people who know what they are doing. One of the reasons why Grepa is here is to 
enforce, uh, make sure that professionalism is here in the industry. And that is why we, we do a lot of training. And so when, when somebody gets into contact with us, like I said, it begins with identification of a property, whether they have it, they have one, or we can help them to identify a property. And then the due diligence processes will begin. Now, there may be an issue in some countries and some jurisdictions where as a foreigner, you're not able to buy certain types of properties, for example. Uh, so I guess the first question would be, can my client buy a property in Ghana? What are restrictions are there on foreigners who don't have any residency or citizenship in Ghana? Great question. Actually, real estate plays a very, very important role in helping a foreigner to even get their residence permit. So for example, if you have a lease contract with any real estate facility or a rental facility, it is able to help expedite your, your stay in Ghana, your residency permits and all of that. That is to say that all your other immigration requirements are correct. So foreigners are, are able to own any kind of property, landed property, but the, the only difference, like I said, on the rehearsal is that property owned by foreigners will have a 50 year lease, lease term and the property owned by locals or Guineans will have a 99 year lease term. And this is the land. So just usually this is the only difference between a foreigner and a Ghanaian. So in other words, if you're buying a property in Ghana, you're buying the structure on the land, but you're technically leasing the land. So the yes. land, you don't own the land outright and let's say in fee simple, as we would call it, you're, you're leasing the land, but you own the structure that's built on it. Yes, so it's not that is not exclusive to foreigners. That's the system. So that's the in system. Ghana, yes, it's the system is Ghana. Nobody owns the land. You 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 lease the land for a certain lease term. So that's that's the, that's the system here, okay. which is renewable upon expiry. Okay, that was going to be my next question. So mm -hmm. the only difference then is if you're a foreign national, your lease would be for fifty years. If if you're a Ghanaian national the lease would be for 100 years. 99 years. 99 years, but in both cases, renewable. Um, Absolutely. Once, once we've identified the process and you know, doing, doing research on the real estate uh, industry in, in, in Ghana, it actually seems like the process is fairly similar to what we do in the United States. It's, it's, it's a process that's fairly recognizable to us. So you mentioned doing due diligence. But what about the initial step of making an offer? Once we've identified the property, we've, we've viewed it, uh, we, we're, we're interested, we wanna make the offer. What is the process for making an offer? What's required to sort of seal the deal? Yes, so if you, if you are dealing with professionals, like grandpa and grandpa associate, grandpa members, they, they know how to go about it. If you are dealing with other people that you, we cannot vouch their, their professionalism, then you may have to um, get in attorneys involved or probably get in uh, notary service. We do have that also in our courts. You can get them involved. But we as professionals, we bring in attorneys when there's a need to bring them. We already know the steps and the processes. So when there are attorneys, there are need to bring attorneys, we bring them, right? There's a need to bring any other professional that will help even, even in negotiations, we are able to negotiate on behalf of the client and all of that. So yes, unless you are not dealing with a the professional, then you may need an attorney to secure your interest or something like that. And in terms of, you mentioned negotiation, what's the negotiation process like? Is it typically a difficult process? Um, I mean, I know obviously in different, in, in, in different jurisdictions, uh, you know, if you list the price, it is what it is. What, what, what's, what's the, how long does it take 
to negotiate a transaction. If you make an offer, are you making an offer in the form of a contract or is it just a, like a binder? What, what, is, what is the process for actually making, for making the offer? Okay, so there's a very informal practice here in Ghana, and that's what we are trying to change. And so sometimes these things are done verbally. We, we run offices, we have documents. We, we, so offers are made in contracts, offers are made in written formats. Okay, so the, the, one of the challenges we have is the fact that, of course, and I believe with the introduction of the MLS, some, uh, some few years, we are going to be able to solve that problem. That challenge is that we do not have um, market analysis data. So pricing is a little bit haphazard. And due to that, because you were asking of how negotiations are done, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm giving a background to that. Due to that, it makes negotiation like a, a little bit difficult. If there were, if the MLS has a comparative market analysis, it, 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 can, it can suggest the market um, price trend for certain areas. So it will be easier to, to tell people that this property does not cost this amount or should not cost this amount. Similar properties in this area is ranging between this and this. But because we don't have all of that, which is what the MLS is gradually trying to solve, it makes negotiation a little bit easier. You know, right. land property owners are still other months when they call prices and all of that. So gradually, we are we are making a move for the, this big change. So the negotiation is basically it can be it can be difficult then because you don't have that kind of market data. Um, but w- w- once we agree on a price, how do we put that, how do we take the next step? What do we do? Do we put it in writing? Do we hire an attorney like we do here a lot of times in the United States? Not every, not every jurisdiction in the United States uh, uses, uses an attorney for the contract prices. In, in downstate New York, we do. In upstate New York, for example, we don't. Um, so in, in, in Ghana, what would be the process for formalizing? that deal we we typically involve attorneys um we don't like i said this is a very very young industry and getting it to be professional very professional is it's a bit difficult because change is difficult to embrace so in order to avoid so many problems we typically involve attorneys except maybe for for smaller value transactions like maybe rental or some of the very very easy to easy to assess transactions but with bigger transactions we we involve in attorneys but in Ghana also any written agreement signed by two parties are binding and it's accepted in any law court so some of the people out there um, informal or not, they do write their own contracts and they sign them and it becomes valid. So like I also said, there are services of notary. If you go to the courts, courthouses, mostly they have these people who are registered and licensed by the government to be able to carry out some of these transactions. So um, this is how it goes once we have, we have agreed um on yes so once the attorney puts the contract in and i'm assuming both parties are going to have a con- an attorney right if 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 the buyer if the buyer is hiring an attorney is it safe to say that the seller will get an attorney as well we can have an attorney representing both of, the, of them both okay and yes. and do both parties have to agree on who that attorney is or are, are attorneys seen more as an independent party that can be trusted by both sides. I, I believe both parties will have to be comfortable with this attorney. Yes. Okay. And so once the attorney formalizes the terms of the agreement and puts it in writing, 
that agreement then gets signed by both parties, right? Yes. And then yes. are there periods of time are there that are built into the contract where the parties will be able to do their due diligence? Is that when the due diligence starts? Or, or do you start the due diligence process even sooner? Well, so at Grepa, we are deeply involved in the due diligence processes. So we take it all upon ourselves as professional agents to commence the due diligence and go through to find out and dig behind the properties and find out all that we can find about the property to make sure that it conforms with what we already know. So most of, before we commence and bring in the due, uh, a lot attorney, a lot of the due diligence will have been done. Mm -hmm. So tell us a little bit about what type of due diligence you do there. One of the big things that we do here in the United States is we do the title search. You know, we want to make sure that number one, this piece of property that we're buying is actually owned by the seller, right? Uh, as I say, we, you know, you don't own the Brooklyn Bridge. Don't try to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, we want to make sure that the property is owned by the seller. We also want to make sure there are no liens, encumbrances on the property, anything that is going to cloud the title, as we say. So when you talk about due diligence, do you utilize the services of, of a title company? Is there a professional that does the same kind of work that a title company might do? Maybe they do they offer insurance? to guarantee against uh, any possibility that there may be a cloud in the title? Okay, so um, real estate is basically about land, landed properties. So in Ghana, yes, the, the, the bigger part of the due diligence is to get in touch with the Lands Commission. And the Lands Commission has, the Lands Commission is responsible for the title search and they have records of all owners of a particular property, landed property, um, from, from the first person and the whole chain of how many owners that has changed hands to the moment you are doing the search. So yes, we do title search and also try to make sure that there's no um, Wow. Mortgage or yes, there's no kind of in America. I think you call it a lien, right? Yes. Yeah. Cloud. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So we, we do make sure of that as well. I mean, it's not an easy ride when it comes to that side, but we, we are we are trying. We are beginning. We are beginning, so we are trying. <laughs> and I think yes. in, so you're able to identify it um, on the property. Well, if there's any lien uh, mortgage on the property, I will also identify. I know there's been um, cases that people have tried to sell properties that they have used as collateral mm -hmm. banks. The part, you know, there is a collateral on the on the property, and the property cannot be sold. So um, it's just an awareness and also education that we need to keep going to let people know that the system is place. So in, in the U.S., we use a title company. Title companies will offer insurance that guarantees clean title. Um, you know, in, in France, they go to the local government at the local uh, local clerk's office. They do the they do that uh, that that due diligence. Uh, so people have that security that they're getting clean title. So once once we are at the point where we have that satisfaction that that title is clean. What other things do we need to look at? What about the condition of the property, for example? Uh, do we have a period where we can do an inspection? Is the, an inspection something that's expected will be done? How do we, how, do, how does a buyer go about that? Figuring out that, okay, this, this property looks nice, but is it structurally sound? Yes. So yes, an inspection will be set up by by us um we arrange that and we are part of this inspection we, we, we personally go with the, the client and um when there are concerns the client will just point them out to us and then we are also able to pass it on so 
we do have inspections just like uh, to make, first, first of all to make sure that the property truly 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 exists and there there are cases where um just by being physically present on the property if there are other issues surrounding the property you can easily detect it so just by going and inspecting it plays a very very important role great and so, so this I'd like, to, I'd like to add to it tony uh so with uh um title i don't know i think i got disconnected a little bit but as far as title is concerned we do not have title companies in ghana right now uh as you can tell it's a work in progress and uh, we're trying to hit all these milestones in trying to uh, develop the market. So we're still trying to get there. One of our members uh, tried to set up a title company in Ghana. Um, he has experience in the Californian market and he relocated to Ghana, he tried it. He's still working on it. For now, I know what he's doing is kind of uh, escrow is what he's doing right now. Um, guaranteeing title is a little uh, shady right now. Um, you just have to do a very good due diligence and make sure that you're buying from the right person and you're using the right professional. As far as inspections are concerned, uh, we do not currently have a professional property inspection. So like Kwabna was saying, you know, as a professional real estate agent, you do your own physical and, you know, look for, um, you know, uh, effects on the property that you can see with your eyes. And then um, if there's anything that you recommend to your clients, you do so. There actually has been um, a couple of uh, members that have also um, decided to set up an inspection company. Uh, one of them just relocated, again, relocated from Texas uh, to Ghana. Um, the, the wife is a realtor and the husband is a property inspector, professional inspector from Texas. So he has experience and he's been doing some inspections. He's done inspections for me properly, uh, personally. Um, so he does the inspections just like, you know, we do in the U.S. He goes to the roof. He checks all the utility systems and um, just structural systems and everything. So he's also coming up with an inspection company. He's trying to get all the certifications, uh, international certifications and all that. Um, so we're looking up to him. He wants to start doing some training as well. So again, that's also something we're, we're working on. So inspections and um, um, inspections and also title is something that we'll be working on in the next coming years. Okay, so buyers have the ability to do a more intrusive inspection as long as they find someone that they they trust or that can be exactly. recommended to them. Uh, and, and, and is this due diligence done? So we're doing this before we sign the contract, right? Is this happening before we sign the actual contract? We're doing our inspections. We're doing the, the due diligence with the title work. That is correct, yes. Because as an agent, you need to make sure that uh, you, you are performing your activities, you know, per your client's uh, goals. So you need to make sure that you're protecting the client in Ghana as well. Um, so they definitely do that. And these have been some of the training sessions that we've been having um, during the COVID period. We had several, we used the opportunity to have several training sessions, discussions uh, via, uh, via Zoom. And so we will discuss some of these things on, you know, how to uh, help the client uh, identify some of these things. And, and the agents are really learning a lot from, from um, international best practice. And of course, the big question, how, how do we pay for all this? Um, are most of buyers in Ghana cash buyers? Uh, do most buyers get financing? Specifically international buyers, are they mostly uh, cash buyers? Are there opportunities for foreigners to get financing from a Ghanaian bank? I'll just take a little bit of that question and then Kwabna can join uh, because it's his session, not mine. Um, <laughs> In answering that, I'll piggyback on one of the questions that you asked um, regarding uh, negotiations. I wanted to uh, chip in that negotiations in Ghana are a little bit tough because most of the properties are owned. A lot of people in Ghana in the past um, 20, 30 years never actually took mortgages on their property. So they own the properties free and clear, 
So when it comes to nego negotiations, they really don't care, you know, whether they're still paying interest or whatever is going on. Uh, they really don't care. So the property sits on the market as, as long as they want and all they're looking for is, you know, what they want. So that makes negotiation very difficult in, in Ghana. Now, going back to the current question, um, mortgages are very, very um, difficult to get because they, they, the, the mortgage companies would usually give mortgages to uh, government workers or people who are, you know, have a job. Uh, they don't look at people like over here in the U.S. We look at the 1099s and people who have are self-employed and all that. You, you will not be able to get a mortgage. So, uh, but now you can take it from here. Yes, like um, like Mr. Sampa is saying. Um, however, in the past few years, mortgages did not exist at all. Now they do exist, but like she said, it's difficult. It's difficult, and I think I, I explained earlier that there's a lot of um, capital action from the government, so the, it leaves a little a little capital for mortgages and all of that. But um, the government last year uh, rolled out an initiative that was going to put 1 billion Ghana cities into and mortgage finance scheme to help the real estate industry to grow. So um, our advocacy this time also has yielded some kind of um, results whereby government is paying attention and seeing the need to back a certain mortgage structure so that people can, but the system at the moment that supplies not discriminatory, even foreigners would be able to assess that. And locals would also be able to assess that. We have a few banks which are trying to be able to do that. We used to have a Ghana Home Loans Bank. Um, it has merged up with another company, but the, the structures are there. We just need more capital to be able to get people to and our, our, our foreign buyers, and we'll, you know, specifically we'll focus on the foreign buyers, obviously, uh, since that's our, our main audience here today. Uh, are they required to provide proof of funding? I mean, here in the United States, if you're going to offer a million dollars for a property, then, you know, most sellers want to see that proof that you either have that million dollars cash in the bank or you have uh, uh a lender, uh, lender financing lined up. So is there a process for that? Is that something that sellers in Ghana are looking for from buyers before they even enter any of this negotiation? So when, when it comes to using a, a bank for a mortgage facility, for example, we, we are very close to one of the um, mortgage um, banks, the banks who offer mortgage, Republic Bank and we, we, we deal with them a lot and they, they, of course, they make sure that you are in the right position to be able to pay off the mortgage. They are going to also have to require, request a lot of um, documentation from wherever you, you live or your jurisdiction to make sure that, yes, you are in the right category to be able to qualify for the facility. So, yes, um, it happens. In Ghana, typically, um, you need to have to prove that your, your income qualifies you within a certain bracket or certain limits to be able to, to qualify for that. You remember that this is not widely accessible, like Mr. Samba said. So they, they have the flexibility to be able to choose and pick or make sure everybody who qualifies is in the right um, category that they want to capture. Got it. And, and one of the things, obviously, we have to factor in because it's not just the purchase price, right? There are taxes, there are stamp duties. What, what are the costs that are associated with buying a property in Ghana? Whether it be legal fees, the fees associated with due diligence, inspections, title search, and your various stamp duties, tax, tax, uh, taxes, and things like that. What, what is that? basically add up to what are we looking at in terms of other expenses we forgot real estate commission yeah. <laughs> oh, <no. There's... laughs> 
<laughs> What's that? <laughs> yeah, Tony, I want I want Mrs. Sampa to take this and then I'll probably add. No, I hope it's not because I chipped in. I just wanted to tell <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I, I, I will take it. Of course, real estate commissions, um, attorney fees, definitely. Unfortunately, our attorney fees are a little higher than um, what we see in the US. Um, sometimes we see percentages of, of, the, of the purchase price. Um, we also have um, title searches. I mean, everything is similar to what we have here. Uh, consultation fees, um, stamps, definitely, and also taxes, yes. Right. And the, the tax, the stamp duties, things like that, wh what percentage of the purchase price would you say makes up those initial initial fees? We're looking at about 10%. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, including uh, commissions. Great. Got it. Got it. And what, now, w once you own the property, first of all, how long would this whole process take? We've done our due diligence, we've negotiated a deal, We've entered into a contract. We've checked the title. Uh, how long does this whole process take? Because a lot of the work is being done pre, pre contract, right? So by the time we sign a contract, from that point on, what is the timing from that point until the closing? Typically in Ghana, most people are cash buyers. So within a week or two, you, it's closed. Um, mortgages take about 30 days. They are also very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Unless there's, um, you know, there's a problem somewhere that the banks will have to um, look into. Other than that, they are also very, very, I'm, I'm very surprised with the way uh, the mortgage um, transactions go very quick. Uh, the, yeah. uh, I think the underwriters are in-house. <clears throat> Uh, the mortgage companies are smaller mortgage companies and underwriters are in-house. So it's very easy for them to underwrite these and, you know, uh, push it through closing. Great, great. And we, we, we don't have much longer left. I'm trying, I'm also trying to incorporate some of the questions that we are getting in the Q&A. Um, but once we close in the property, what are the property tax implications, for example, for, let's say, you know, I own a uh, single family home or a condo unit or maybe it's a mixed use property. What are the different property tax consequences that I have to factor into my investment analysis uh, for, for, for the future? Okay, I'll take that. I, I believe, <clears throat> so when it comes to, when it comes to property tax, uh, we, we have to handle only one property tax, which is coming from the government, which is coming from the municipality or the, the the district or metropolitan area where you find the property. So annually you have to pay something small to the government. And this is not, this is for physical properties on the land. So if you if you if you get a condo or if it is an apartment complex, the owner of the property is dealing with uh, government on this this one, or the, the company that may have set up their apartment complex is dealing with government on this one. So basically it's something very small. Now that we have the real estate council coming in, in place, maybe there's going to be a review of some of these things because now government is paying much closer attention to real estate and to use real estate to be able to generate some more capital. So yes, remember if the government is giving 1 billion Ghana cities to, to help with mortgage, then it is also going to find ways to be able to raise certain taxes to be able to make money. So yes, um, for now, assistance, there's only one property issue and it's not discriminatory. The same way locals um, pay as uh, foreigners. So yes. Okay, we got a good question here. What happens to the property you own, but the land lease is not renewed? Does that ever happen? You get a 50 year lease. What if they say, sorry? Um, <laughs> well, a lot of a lot of people have asked, a lot of locals have also asked the same questions after 99 years. I mean, if we've been most of the time we live to be 99 years, we don't even have the memory to remember what, 
when this, <laughs> but the, the, the issue is that it is a renewable uh, lease term. It does not have these clauses that will say, once it's not renewed, we take it, government is taking it or anything, but you have to probably pay some penalty and then be able to renew it again. I see. Okay. And then just a couple of other questions, because if, I, if I'm owning a property that maybe I'm going to use as an Airbnb, I'm going to rent it out. Uh, maybe I own an apartment complex in Ghana. I want to rent it out. What type of rent regulation? Are there rent regulations? Obviously, that could be a whole other uh, uh, discussion. But as an investor, whether you, if you're owning a property that you're going to maybe rent out to a tenant, are there certain legal requirements we need to know about rent regulations, uh, you know, that are going to impede our ability to get the kind of return that we're anticipating? Well, um, probably not in terms of pricing the anything, but we do have um, the rent control um, agency, which recently we have had some very serious issues, credit card issues with them recently, and. Um, they have been regulating rental conflicts and all of that. They also have a, some kind of a, a guideline for homeowners or land, landlords. So for rental agencies, now we do have a lot of apartment complexes and all of that who are renting us. So they have a, a code or a, a guideline from this government institution which kind of guide them and all of that, except for the transactions as to the monetary transactions that will be involved in a rental. That it, and that pretty much applies to any rental property, right? Not just yes, commercial, mm -hmm, commercial and residential. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then you know, just as we we have just a couple of minutes, uh, you mentioned something about getting residency. Uh, so, you know, we like to talk a little bit about golden visa programs that a lot of countries offer. I'm not sure Ghana offers a golden visa program, but you did mention that there is a pathway um, that buying real estate gives you into getting that kind of residency that a lot of investors are interested in. Yes. So it's, it's, it, it provides one of the fastest ways to expedite your process. Um, first of all, like I said, when all immigration requirements are met, then getting involved, even as a small lease contract or rental contracts is, is a safe way to secure as much as you are able to uh, get government to understand why you're here in the country to do business or whichever way, whichever reason why you're here in the country. That immigration is sorted and then real estate gets you a surest way to expedite your, your process. And then finally, probably the least interesting question of all uh, for, for our audience, uh, commissions. So we have a CIPS agent or anyone really who's licensed here in the United States or another country. We have a client, we wanna refer them to a licensed professional in Ghana. What, what is the mechanism for paying a referral fee? What's the mechanism for what? For paying, for paying a referral fee to uh, an agent, let's say in the United States, who refers someone to uh, you know, your real estate company in, in Ghana. Okay. Excellent. So, um, well, yes, we, we typically, we, and I mean grandpa, <laughs> I mean at grandpa, we, so we typically want to be found in between the international standard commission rates. So we, we, that's what we do. When, when we have other people who are helping in the, like, like for example, a co-listing a a agent or something, I have a, I have a contract with a, a homeowner and I was able to talk to him and negotiate 5% for my company and 2% for a co-listing agent, you understand? So, like I said, and I, and I told him it is fair, and he believes it. This is a client that lives in the United States of America. He believes it. He said, okay, yeah, that's fair. So, typically, we want to find ourselves in the International Standard Commission bracket. 
Great, great. And then one one last question because we're a little bit over our time. Kobena, I told you one hour would go by really, really fast. Um, so what, one last question, just to give people a little bit of a, 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 of, a, of, a, of an idea of what the price of a home, and of course a home could mean a lot of different things, uh, what the price of a home is in Ghana, let's just say maybe Accra, let's focus on the big city, right? Let's see the price of a, of a condo unit, one or two bedrooms, just to give people an idea. <laughs> This is this is very interesting. Uh, Mrs. Mrs. Sampa will go in first. I'll come back later. <laughs> okay, so typically it depends on the location of the property you're looking for. Of course, prime areas are more expensive. Um, and we have two different kinds of prime areas as well. Um, city centers, uh, there are certain cities like uh, around the airports, anything within the five, 10 mile radius of the airport, you're looking at two bedroom condo for about 400. The number. Um, you know, depending on, you know, the building and all the um, facilities that they provide. Some have swimming pools, others don't have. So you're looking between three to $400,000 for a condo. Some are even about a million, you know, um, in the cities. And those, you know, have luxury um, facilities that comes with it. Um, when you go, you know, out a little bit, you can find something, a condo within the $150,000, $250,000 for a condo. Single family homes in those same areas outside the city, um, you're looking at about single family home, $150,000, $250,000 average. Of course, you can find three fifty, four hundred dollars $400,000 also. Um, single family homes are not that common in the prime, very prime areas uh, because people, because of the density, uh, they're building more condos than single family homes. But of course, you can still find some single family homes around the American embassies and, uh, um, you know, around that area for about a million, a million and a half. Um, there's also land around the same price, 1.5 million, 2 million around the prime areas. Great. Great, super. Well, I hate to do this, but we're a little bit over time. Great, great, great discussion. Um, I think we really learned a lot today. Kobena, thank you so much for joining us. Vicky, thank you uh, for joining us. Very, very nice to have you. Uh, you know, the, the, the founder of, 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 of Grepa, and uh, we owe so much to you as professional realtors for helping to really institutionalize uh, the practice of, of real estate in, in Ghana and making it safer and, and uh, uh, more inviting to people from all over the world to come and invest in, in Ghana. So thanks so much for all this information. Um, for everyone who's a panel uh, in the audience right now, if you missed some part of uh, this discussion today, it will be in our website. Uh, Kathleen did put the website address in the chat room. So please feel free to visit us at hgar.com uh, or just Google Global Business Council HGAR. You'll find us there. You'll see all of our global business chat recordings. We've did many of we've done many of them. Uh, we've done Ni Nigeria, Nicaragua, France, Italy, Portugal. Uh, we, we've done Australia recently. So you'll find our whole catalog of global business chats on the website. And please uh, look at our website for other events that we're having, for other events that we co-sponsor with other global business councils. And we look forward to seeing you uh, in the future. So let's build our network and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. So Tony, um, I just have one more thing I needed to pass across that um, Ghana is a gateway. The Ghana Real Estate Professional Association is well positioned to bring all the clarity and all the, the trust, the integrity in all real estate transactions. We're inviting investors from around the world and we're excited, we're excited uh, about the Global Business Council of the Hudson uh, Gateway. So we thank you for this opportunity also. And then we want to say that you can reach us at the Ghana Real Estate Professionals Association, info at info at repagh.org. And our phone numbers um, 
0575. I put it on uh, the chat, Reggie. Oh, you, oh, you did? Oh, yes. plus two okay, take Plus, and if anyone else wants your contact information, please feel free to reach out to me. Excellent. Me back. We will absolutely send out that information to you. Excellent. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank Great. you. So much. Thank you. Thank you, Kabena. Thanks for joining we, us. We have we have to do this again. Um, absolutely. Much. Absolutely. Getting some great feedback. This was very informative and we look to collaborate with you again in the future. And happy holidays to everybody. Thank you. Happy holidays to you too. Bye-bye. We'll see you next time. Sure. Bye, Tony. Bye-bye. <clears throat>